I'm Olivia Trono. I'm a podcast producer, and I'm also a research fellow at the Modern Literature and Culture Research Center at X University. At the outset of the pandemic, a lot of comparisons were being made between the modernist period and today. That may be one of the reasons why the Modern Literature and Culture Research Center was able to start studying the pandemic very quickly. The MLC's Dr. Irena Gamal and Dr. Jason Wong have co-edited a collection of essays coming out in March of this year. It's called Creative Resilience in COVID-19, Figuring the Everyday in the Pandemic. I was interested in learning more about how the MLC has shifted their research focus since the start of the pandemic. So I sat down with Dr. Gamal and Dr. Wang to talk about it. Could both of you introduce yourselves a little bit? My name is Irene Gamal, and I'm the director at the Modern Literature and Culture Research Center, and I'm also the author of articles and books dedicated to gender and forgotten women, and more recently, the co-edited collection, Creative Resilience. My name is Jason Wang. I'm the executive member at the MLC Research Center, and I am the co-editor of Creative Resilience and the COVID-19. Can you briefly describe the mandate of the MLC Research Center before the pandemic, and then whether you believe your mandate or research approach has shifted since the start of the pandemic? So before the pandemic, our mandate was to research the literature and culture of the modern era. So in the early 20th century to about 1945, and we also focused very much on the stories of forgotten women. So a lot of the work that we've been doing is we're concerned with recovery of voices that have not really been heard before. With a pandemic, our focus certainly shifted because from one day to the next, we found ourselves in just total isolation Everything was quiet on the streets. We couldn't gather anymore as a team, which was so important for us at the MLC, where we also have an in-person library. And so we had to shift gears. And it was at that point that our pandemic webinar series was born. I just wanted to extend what Irena just said, that, you know, in-person activity is actually a a very important component for the MLC work. In addition to the MLC library, we also have a big archives for rare books, first editions and historical periodicals, and also fashion garments uh, from the modernist period as well. So a lot of our research associates and the research assistants and uh, our own in-house scholars rely on those material objects a lot for for their own projects. So when the public health measures happened during the beginning of the pandemic, our center had to make a decision that we either have to pause our ongoing research projects or we have to move our entire operation online in a very short period of time. And as Irena said, that, you know, MLC pandemic webinar series is is one of our digital enterprises that we get out of during the first wave of the pandemic. I want to talk about the pandemic webinar series. So each webinar includes a panel or kind of lecture that allows for a discussion about a certain facet of the pandemic. So you've covered such a broad range of topics from COVID-19 and social activism, xenophobia, COVID-19 and the media and public narratives, COVID-19 and its relationship to the elderly, to cities, to comics and forms of storytelling. And at the time of this recording, you've held 21 webinar sessions the first having been in April 2020. So I'm curious, can you tell me a little bit more about where the idea for the series came from and how you spurred this into action so fast? The pandemic webinar series was really born out of that moment of crisis, this experience of deep uncertainty, being unsettled, being suddenly silenced, being suddenly locked out. So all of this kind of galvanized us behind the scenes. You know, for example, Jason and I were always very active in communicating with each other. 
And it was actually Jason who first suggested that we host a gathering, a webinar. He said we can very easily do that. We brainstormed on it and we came up with the idea of our first webinar. At that point, we did not really think that we were launching a webinar series. We were simply thinking that we were kind of bridging over this hiatus, this terrible sense of crisis by doing something meaningful and gathering the troops together at the MLC. But then we realized that in addition to people at the MLC, we actually had a lot of people at the university and the outside world that were interested in this, that were joining us and were joining the conversation. These people in turn made many suggestions and said, oh, why don't we do this next week? Why don't we do that particular topic? And that feedback loop then continued toward continuing the series as the pandemic continued. And with each session, we gathered new people. And at times, we had almost 200 participants for a session. On average, we had just over 100. But even over 100 was a very large group, a very large platform for us to communicate with and to learn about the pandemic. I would like to add that actually when Iran and I started discussing this webinar, it was actually one day before the official lockdown in Ontario. When we uh, read the news that on- Ontario is going on lockdown the next day, we were thinking, you know, as a humanity scholars or liberal arts in general, what we can do to contribute into a crisis like this. Even though we did not know how long this pandemic would last, but we knew that it would be a crisis because, you know, outside of Canada, in both China or Southern European countries, the pandemic already hit those regions extremely hard. So we were asking ourselves what we could do as humanity scholars, as literature scholars. And this goes back to the core value of our MLC Research Center, that we have the experience of study historical upheavals, reconstructions, but also crises, including wars or, or culture changes during the early 20th century, the, the modernist period. So we were confronted with the idea that, you know, when we are in this moment and looking at a global public health crisis, what we can do to make a contribution to the dialogue of this global pandemic. And one thing that I think make our pandemic webinar series really unique is the arts and the culture angle of it. You know, when the pandemic just started, I, I don't think any non-medical scholars are actually will be called COVID-19 scholars because everyone in academia, including ourselves, we were just trying to navigate in what's going on during this crisis. But what we are really happy is that our panelists usually then come from completely different disciplines and they are willing to share their ideas from their own background and their own studies or research and collectively create an ambition that we can tackle this pandemic through kind of a non-medical study. Mm -hmm. I think another interesting feature in that context is also sort of this acceleration of innovation and technology. That's an element that we find very strongly represented in the modernist era, and we've examined that previously. And this time around, In March 2020, we were suddenly confronted with that. We suddenly had to embrace the reality of accelerating our knowledge of technology and our comfort with technology, maybe even some of the things that we'd resisted before because it had become the only way to communicate and to bridge across isolation. So I think that's an interesting element that connects sort of our previous research with the COVID-19 era. I want to pick up on exactly kind of what you've just said in that way, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of comparisons were being made to the Spanish flu pandemic, and a lot of people also began hypothesizing that post our current pandemic, we would be entering another roaring 20s type phase. We are not there yet, so we're still still tight. We'll see. We're already in the 20s, though. (laughs) Yeah, but hopefully not the roaring part. Maybe just the responsible 20s where everyone just carefully goes back. But as scholars who are very familiar with this period, do you agree with these comparisons and parallels that everyone was really making? But also, 
you've mentioned this time of technological upheaval. Are there other direct ties or parallels between this period and the modernist period in our current time that we could learn from or that maybe aren't as frequently talked about? I think the connection to a new post-pandemic party culture is certainly very well taken. The other day, Jason and I talked about upcoming courses to teach. And Jason was immediately saying, well, why don't you teach something on the party, i.e. the gathering, social gatherings post-pandemic, because that will become a very important feature. I think there are two ways of going about this after periods of isolation as we've experienced them. Number one, people become shyer, people actually want to be more on their own, and people feel discomfort suddenly about being back together again. I think on another level, there will be the opposite stream. There will be people who will just be so hungry for gatherings, for parties, and so on. So there will be some makeup time on that level as well. So we may still witness the roaring 20s again. That's really interesting in part Do you know if there was also that introverted, very careful stepping back in the modernist period as well, post-pandemic? Is it just that the parties were so huge that that's all we hear about and we think that everyone was doing that? Was there also the people who stepped back and retreated? I think definitely in the modernist period, we had that element also of interiority. You see it in the stream of consciousness that was developed, you know, even just pre-war by Virginia Woolf, by James Joyce, you know, even with Ulysses in 1922 and uh, William Faulkner in the United States. So in that sense, this interiority, this really looking inside is also something that is fueled by this enforced sort of lockup. Hmm. The other thing I would like to add is the creative possibilities after a crisis like this. As Irana mentioned that, you know, the First World War, for example, Irana just published a new book on forgotten Canadian artist, a female artist, uh, Marit Hamilton, who went to the battlefield after the First World War and painted the battlefield itself. And in, in those paintings, you can see the idea of not only witnessing a documentation, but also kind of a culture approach, a psychological approach to memorization. So what's the politics of remembering such a big crisis in such a large scale? And I think by doing this book with Irena together on the creative resilience and the COVID-19, we also see that there are a lot of writers and artists and journalists and even, you know, everyday ordinary people are using their limited access of resources but make something really extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And what our book Creative Resilience does is that memorialization of the pain, of the stress, of the uncertainty that we all lived through. And we do that by looking at the artworks, by looking at the memoirs, by looking at the diaries that have been produced during this time. And that is a way of working through. And I want to talk a little bit more about the book, but you've just said, both of you, the importance of memorialization, of really kind of distilling in art, in writing, in all different mediums and forms, the importance of this period. To someone who is maybe not as familiar with archives or studying a period as it's transpiring, why is it so important? Because maybe someone would say, oh, but we're all here. We're living through it. We'll remember. We don't. But I think it's important to remember and memorialize a crisis and a trauma so that we don't forget it so that we learn from it and so that we also work through it. If we just brush it aside, especially something of the magnitude of a pandemic, it will catch up with us and it will come out in other ways. And so it's important that we pause, that we look at it and that we say, what did it do to me? What did it do to my identity? What did it do to my family? And what happened during that time? So all of these elements, they need to be remembered. They need to be dealt with so that we can move forward and not be damaged by the experience itself. And I think there is hope 
in the pandemic, but I think it's important also to deal with the pain, to realize the pain, to acknowledge the pain, to provide a bit of a platform for that. Yeah, a crisis like COVID nineteen, it's always like a crisis of the personal, right? Like each individual experiences this pandemic in their own unique ways, and some people might be able to constitute this memory through the practice of art making or writing. But we also have to admit that a lot of people are actually would suppress this memory as well. And in in their art making or writing or even writing a diary, there are a lot of self surveillance there as well. Because when 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 a crisis、uh, like the COVID nineteen, it brings a lot of traumatic memories, and and those memories are often private, and they are not willing to share in a more public kind of format or, or kind of artistic、uh, manifestations. There is a lot of comparison between the writing or art making about COVID nineteen in relation to the nine eleven crisis. What is very unique about this,、uh, what we call the post nine eleven fiction or literature, is that the actually the initial writers' reaction towards the crisis about the events themselves. But later on, a lot of writers and start looking at what's the lingering aftermath of such events on you know ordinary people's daily life. Whether it's through you know racial profilings or some global economic entanglement, so I'm pretty sure we will see a lot of fictional accounts or autobiographical accounts of、uh, the COVID-19 crisis, as we already witness some of them emerging. But also, I think we will see more of what's the actual lingering consequences of this crisis on everyday life, and especially through more like a grassroots perspective. And initially, in the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people were like, "Oh, we're all in this together, same boat." But no, it's not been a universal pandemic. There have been so many different experiences that perhaps we don't even know about yet. Exactly, there are a lot of different experiences. There's a lot of inequity and increasing inequity. And I think when you do a study, when you look at the diaries of individual people and seek out their voices and make sure that you have a diverse picture, this image of increasing diversity will be revealed. And that is also one of the goals of creative resilience. So we've all mentioned your book that is coming out soon, edited by the two of you, called "Creative Resilience in COVID-19: Figuring the Everyday in the Pandemic," and it features essays from international scholars on topics ranging from Netflix and digital distraction to women's sexual, domestic, and emotional labor to comics and performance and issues of immigration. So. Like the pandemic webinar series, really a broad range of topics to ensure that a lot of different stories and experiences are being reflected. We've already touched on some of the overarching themes and through lines that you've found in these essays and editing and compiling them. I'm curious if there are any more particular through lines that you found, or if it demonstrated that the creative resilience is manifest in so many different ways. In our book, creative resilience and COVID nineteen, we started out with a number of core research questions. One of which was, how do the aesthetics of the everyday help with coping with danger and crisis? And that's what many of these chapters embraced. Or how do writers and artists navigate and respond to the pandemic through arts and culture? In other words, we were interested in what is the role of arts and culture during a pandemic. What can they do to help people navigate these new experiences, these uncertainties, this wrestling with finding a new discourse and solutions? And so, in the book itself, we moved from first articulations of crises to, in the end, articulations of hope and adaptation. So we were trying to reflect both of these elements because we feel it's very much a dual experience that most of us went through. And often, on a daily basis, we encountered both. Despair and fear and uncertainty, but also these elements of human connection, of breaking through, and of making good headway. 
all of that we were trying to articulate with creative resilience and COVID-19. When we started this book, we actually had a kind of a basic line of ideas regarding what we want to do. And this is actually joining from our own MLC pandemic webinar series. A lot of topics that we covered in our webinar series is also the topics of the everyday life. And the crisis of a global pandemic is always the crisis of the everyday life. That itself is very complex, but not necessarily always being covered, let's say, by the mass media or other form of kind of communication. Of course, you know, when the pandemic started, we were all fed with big numbers and, and, and the scary numbers. But we were really curious, what is the stories behind those big narrative or grand narratives? What are actually the ordinary people's everyday life during the COVID-19? And again, there is a role that arts and culture could play in such a public health crisis, as well as, as we see it in doing this book that, you know, from neighbors take social distance walking in the neighborhood to, you know, artists make comics. And, and uh, there are different ways that what we call the creative resilience actually manifested in those everyday life or the everyday pandemic life. The additional element is also that within the scholarly field, the focus was very much on medical issues, which of course it should be. The medical focus needs to be on discovering, oh, what is this virus? How do we combat this virus? How do we get our vaccination? But at the same time, the humanities were really sidelined. And so we wanted to speak up on behalf of the humanities and the arts to give them a voice within this area. And we felt that there was definitely an audience out there that wanted to hear this and that could also see how important the humanities and the arts fields were in contributing toward providing solutions because we are dealing with people and the humanities make humanity living, feeling the focal point of their endeavors. Is there one essay in particular or one line of thinking that just in this conversation you'd like to highlight? The one essay that I'm thinking of very, very fondly is the one that Jason and I co-wrote, co-researched, and it's entitled, Why Has the Outbreak Turned So Deadly? Diary from a Quarantine City. And it is focused on the diary of a Chinese writer by the name of Fang Fang, Wuhan Diary, which turned into a bestseller, and it describes her own experience from the beginning of the outbreak before the world even realized what a problem this would be. And she detailed both the shock and being locked up and finding herself within a very draconian quasi-military lockdown in China and writing about the experience, both the positive, the sort of neighborly help that comes in and the organized sort of food deliveries, and at the same time, also some of the problems and some of the critiques of the government and some of the resistance then that sparked online. And what was fascinating in this online lockdown diary, as we've called it, is the fact that many of the audience members were able to participate in the shaping of this diary because they had very strong opinions. They provided a lot of information. They challenged her knowledge on many fronts. And so her writing was always a writing with this audience already in mind. And I found that aspect fascinating, especially this writing during crisis and how audience participation shapes then this most intimate genre, and that is the diary. So to me, that was a learning experience. It was also an immersion into the Wuhan context specifically, and it was a wonderful learning experience also together with Jason, who shared with me some of his background. And so in that sense, I have a lot of really fond memories of that particular chapter. I learned a lot in researching and writing it. Yeah, since Irana already 
bragged about our own chapter. Maybe I should <laughs> mention an, another chapter that you know often comes to my mind is、uh, by a Canadian recreation scholar Troy Glover, and、uh, he talks about the idea of playing with the city during the pandemic. I mean, when we think of the COVID nineteen pandemic, we're always thinking you know. Crisis and、uh, trauma, but he actually used a more playful term, and also take a kind of institutional framework called placemaking, and looking at how community members, even during the lockdown, how they are able to work through the park, local parks, of course with physical distance, and、uh, to localize the placemaking by the community members themselves without relying too much on institutions. And so that chapter often comes to my mind because pandemic is a urban crisis as well. And for that part, it gives a lot of hope, but also kind of resilient adaptions of community members in the big cities and also the suburbs as well. And perhaps as an interesting complementary scenario to that, we could also cite the paper by Stan and Karen Beeler. Who describe their experiences in Prince George, a smaller town, smaller city in northern British Columbia, and how they basically took their community theatre online, as well as their dog shows online. So <laughs> there is a performance aspect in all of that, in turning it into something that becomes digital. Jason, you said the crisis of everyday life is something that a lot of us are contending with. I'm really interested to hear about what it's been like to research this period as you've been living it, particularly in contrast to the modernist period, as neither of you have, unless you're hiding something from me, neither of you lived through that particular period. So I'm interested in learning more about your experience with it and ultimately why. It has been so important to keep your research so current and timely. When we do the comparison between the modernist period and also what we are experiencing now, yes, they belong to different historical moments, but there are a lot of similarities as well. You know, especially regarding the culture and the social change and the kind of like political upheavals and also. People's opinions about their own contemporary institutions, as well, no matter the trust or distrust, right? So you're maybe more equipped than others, <laughs> in a way. I would not say that, but、uh, <laughs> I think the modernist period offers kind of informing references to look at what we are experiencing now, and there, of course, a lot of researchers already covered that topic as well. The second point I want to mention is again going back to what we have been doing at the MLC Research Center. What we are really proud of ourselves is we are always tackle the moments, even though we use kind of historical literature or philosophy or historical materials and archives as a methodology to look at the present moment. And I think this goes back to what we always talk about at the MLC Research Center is called the scholarly responsibility. And to what extent, as humanity scholars, we need to show the particular responsibilities in our own moments. In a way, it's kind of like the social logical responsibilities of the the literary scholars. I think Jason is making a very important point here on this sort of being engaged. In social life, we understand at the Modern Literature and Culture Research Center that research cannot be something that is divorced from society, from needs, from issues of diversity, from issues of social justice. We firmly believe that research is always immersed in these issues, and that is reflected in the topics that we do. With COVID nineteen. We were still in a special situation because it's different from looking at archival materials of events or women's experiences that happened a hundred years ago, and what happens today in the here and now. What we ourselves are going through with fears and hope. And adaptation. So, in other words, it was something where we were on a much less objective ground. Let's put it that way, in the sense that we were going through experiences ourselves. And one of the big caveats that we had almost 
everywhere, you know, in our pandemic webinar series and so on, was that we are not seeking for these ultimate answers, but that we are very aware that the groping for answers was still a very tentative and ongoing. So we are basically voicing opinions, experiences, looking at artworks and so on, while the crisis is still ongoing. So it's a very different experience. It's a much more immersive experience, but it's also one that I think we will remember for a long time. And it's also a process that makes us much more conscious of what it is that we do. And I want to echo again Jason's point here on the importance of the social responsibility of that, of our connectedness as humans. We are not just here to protect ourselves. It's about protecting the other person beside us and society as a whole. We all have an obligation on that front. Yeah, when Irene and I reflect on our COVID-19 studies at the MLC Research Center, and especially through our MLC pandemic webinar series, we often go back to the idea of the power of the community. It is a collective ambition, a collective enterprise to gather together. It's just like the modernist domestic salons that people just gather together, discuss ideas, why they experience the social and the cultural changes. And this is exactly what we are trying to do uh, through the, our our center. Of course, you know, we are lucky now with technology mediated communication. Our gathering is more international and global, which we count as a very much a privilege itself, is we are able to gather people together with either leading voices in, in particular academic field or our participants, you know, who are local Toastmaster members or book clubs uh, members or even, you know, some professionals from public policy or, or, or think tank. And everyone's willing to gather and share some ideas and, and make these crises a little bit more bearable. And of course, we also have to admit that a format like this itself is a very much a privileged format. But we are trying to make our MLC pandemic webinar series as welcoming, as open space and as democratic spaces as possible. And I think we can also mention in that context the excitement of connecting with other scholars internationally, scholars that we probably would never have met in another world other than this crisis world. So there is something to be said about these new academic friendships that we have developed. We are still in touch with these same people. These are new friendships that we have created. So many exciting things have happened and so many exciting things to come for you both and the center. Thank you so much for talking with me a bit about these things today. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you, Olivia. 